like about your experience in therapy when you first came? Um, it wasn't like what I expected. I sort of had this idea in my mind what it would be and it was completely away from that. Okay. I sort of came with the idea that it was talking, it would solve my eating problems, um, stop me binging um, and make me not frightened of certain foods and not me having that voice in my head calorie counting and stuff. Yeah. Um, I wanted it to stop my, what I call my routines, which are my OCD behaviours. Um, so I was counting certain things and checking things in certain ways and um, going for walks and being in the house at certain times and out at certain times and lots of checking and things in certain positions and stuff like that. Mm. So I wanted therapy to stop that. Um, oh, just moving the plant. <laughs> and um, I wanted therapy to... I knew that I was a, a bad person, as I say, that's what my belief was, um, a horrible person, and I didn't think therapy could change that and make me into a good person, so I thought I wanted therapy just to help me learn how to accept who I was and just accept that I'm not a nice person, and just so I could get on with it, rather than just hating myself because of it. So these are your beliefs about yeah. who you are, what your identity yeah. is, so... All of this is based on the beliefs of who you are as a person. Then. Yeah, okay. and I thought therapy would be a, like a magic cure, really. I'd talk about those things and somebody would tell me what to do to behave and think differently. Right. Okay. And it wasn't like that at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a quick fix no. with no. the answers. Um, it was hard work. Um it was, I was told, sort of like, put straight straight away really, that it wasn't like that. It was the therapy that I was having, and I know there's different types of therapy, but the therapy that I was having was, couldn't predict what was gonna happen or yeah. what was come up. We couldn't just talk about this, this, and this in isolation because they're all linked. And for the first time, it meant, I was looked at as a whole person rather than bits of diagnosis and I went in there thinking I'm bits of diagnosis because that's what I'd been told and therapy was looking at me as a whole Right. for um, a long time I just talked about my issues with food and then he sort of said are you going to stop talking about food and I was like well I'm doing it right I mean, this is what I'm here for to talk about food because that's what I'd learned to do, focus on the food. So when you were in hospital, you focused on the food. Yeah. And then you were shocked because, yeah. you know, now you're not focusing on the food, yeah. you're focusing on you. I were like, well, what else am I supposed to talk about? And, and I thought I was doing therapy right because I was there talking about food, what difficulties I'd had with it, what I'd challenged and eaten or that I'd gone away with work so I didn't eat for two days. And I were talking about those things and he's like, right, now you can stop talking about food, we can look at other things and that was a bit of a shock to me um i were given no false promises like i was in hospital before i'll get to a healthy weight and everything will be all right it was we don't know what we're going to find we're just going to work through it together and see what happens we can't pick and choose what crops up and that that's that's how it was really for the first time i was listened to rather than being talked to and told what to do. What did that feel like to be listened to? Weird. It always, even now, when I had that therapy for a while and seen you for a while, I still find it really weird when you say something I've, or repeat something I said like months ago. And it's like, oh, somebody listened to me. Because I've never not been used to it, it's still a bit of a shock or it makes me giggle and I think, oh, they remembered that name. And it's like, oh, you were really listening to me. You were really taking an interest in, it, in me. Mm. Um, and when I struggle, because with therapy, there was the, there is always that risk that it can make you worse and your behaviour is worse. Um, it wasn't used against me when I struggled, where previously I've been criticised for struggling or not doing as I was told or you know what you should be doing why aren't you doing it mm. um so it was a really weird experience for me 
um, that um, I was being listened to. Um, I was, I was just, somebody were interested in what I had to say rather mm -hmm. than telling me what to do. And I just found that, and still find that really bizarre because I think that in the past I thought that I'm not worth listening to or anybody taking an interest. I'm just like an afterthought or a problem. So it's it's still a bit weird when you say something that you've said okay. I've said ages right. ago. <laughs> okay. So what are the what are some of the beliefs that, that are under these things, you know, the undercurrents to to the beliefs about yourself as you know, not being worthy really of you know, just being in the way a, a bad person as you say. Yeah, I just I just felt that I was always a problem um, because I, I saw myself as different to everybody else, um, like with my routines and my eating, but also because those were my priorities, it made me um, not think about other people and become quite selfish and quite... Um, I need to do my routines, I need to sort my eating out, I need to do this and everything else and everybody else would be um, come secondary. So that was your main focus now is that you had to focus on yeah. on this story that you told yourself about yourself yeah. or that you'd heard from the external Yeah world. and I always felt that I wasn't good enough like at, at um, school and stuff like that you know when you get that I know for some people it might not make a difference, but it fitted in with my belief when I got told you could do better. You know, the classic thing that you get in school reports, could do better. That kind of, I'm like... Better for who? No, I can't do any better. I'm trying my hardest. Yeah. Yeah. And so I always felt... Sorry, better for who? I don't know. It just said could do better, so it just made me felt, feel that I wasn't good enough mm -hmm. compared to other people. Okay. Um, which is what I thought anyway. And... I knew I felt different and I felt odd and because like I'd cross over the road from people so I didn't speak to them and it was rude and my mum would say, well, you're being rude and I was being rude but I just, I was frightened of people or what they'd say to me or um, what they'd want from me and stuff so it did come across as being rude when I wouldn't answer the door or answer the telephone and I'm sat next to it because I'd fear who it was and what they'd want from me so, you know. So instead of... Like you say, you being heard or listened to, it was difficult to express your fear. Yeah. These are actions out of fear, not out of rudeness. Yeah. Or and I and I didn't know that were my, that were my normal. I didn't I didn't know how to be any different, and um like I was horrible to my dad. I used to shout at him all the time, and I used to hit him and stuff, and I couldn't help it, and I felt bad because I just couldn't help it, um, and like I say, rude to people or not talk, ignoring people or that kind of thing. So I felt as if I were a bad person and also um, I didn't mix socially um, very often but when I did a couple of times I went to like a church youth group sort of thing and some of the things that they said um, I um, took on board um, because they were they were saying things about that at that at that age I just didn't want to exist anymore um, I'd cry on a night in bed praying to God which why am I alive why can't I just not be alive and and that kind of thing but like the church was saying if you take your own life you're bad and you'll be punished by God and that's what I wanted to do and right. so I felt that I was being punished by God for How being a bad they person. Know that? I don't know, that's what that's what they that's what they said and they sort of said I knew what had happened to me when I was little and I'd put that aside in one box. But they'd say they'd say stuff about that, about having relationships before marriage were wrong and um how you dressed um made you um a certain way and those kind of things. So when I was young, I just thought, 
it's all my thought and I'm a bad person because I'm doing all these things that people tell you you get punished for mm-hmm. um, so everything in my life sort of just fed into that and re- just endorsed that you're a bad person you're not nice you're rude you're selfish um, you're not as good as everybody else um, and that showed in all aspects of my life yeah so when you think about you know the beliefs that you had then do you still have some of those beliefs now or um have they changed in any they've way? changed um sometimes i don't notice they've changed it's just when stuff like you'll say and notice that i haven't thought a certain way for a while um something that we've worked on for a very long time is sinking in and I'm accepting that I wasn't born bad. Um, My behaviour was, could be seen as bad or not nice, Mm -hmm. but that isn't me. That's um, my response to what happened to me and my response to the world and how I saw myself in the world. So that's a big change that I don't think I was born this bad person. I know it's seen. I've seen it in my notes, which some people might not like, but it helps me that I have been damaged. I'm not damaged, so there's a difference. I wasn't born like this with these difficulties or this bad person. I be my behaviour and my thoughts and feelings changed due to my reaction of what happened to me. Mm-hmm. So I became damaged, if you like, or I became that certain way. So it's like. You recognising your blank slate as you yeah, as you I like say, that really or, really helped when you yeah, explained it like yeah. that. So it's you know the tubular rasa is is kind of the 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 blank slate. So if you think about you know some of the things that I've said, for instance, you know explaining things a little bit as well. So yeah, uh, I love a good s- analogy. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so for for. Lots of people. I remember. Um, I remember many years ago, and uh, friends of mine used to complain about getting older because that's a thing in society is getting older. And she used to complain about getting older. And for a present, I'd bought some cream, some face cream, and she still complained about getting older. And I said, "But the cream sat there, and because it sat there, you're not putting it on your face. So you you're saying." You complain about getting older, but you're not really doing anything about it, and that's that's like what lots of lots of us do um, is we don't become the thing that we want to become. We we tend to you know lots of people will read a book and they'll say oh wow I'll come into therapy and say wow I know this thing this new thing and I can go share it with the world but I'm not actually applying it to myself. It's the same analogy, it's the same as you've got the cream in your house but you're not actually putting it on your own face mm. but you, you're then um, you know, looking out at the world and judging it yeah. and so you're judging it because you know this information but you haven't actually applied it for yourself so really that's inauthentic mm. and so, so that's, what, that's what we tend to do we tend to go look, look, what, look at this new thing that I know but it's not a new thing that I'm doing yeah so then things things actually remain the same and it's only when you do or apply the things that, that they begin to begin to change and yeah. because of your open mindedness as well. So the um And the I am open minded, which is because I was when I first started I was very, very fixed and I was no moving in my beliefs. It's like exactly. I am a bad person, I am evil, yeah. I am this, I yeah. am that very very fixed i must have been a nightmare to be in therapy so it did, with that but you weren't but that's understandable that you know because you've been programmed with these things for since birth um on your blank slate that of course you're going to have the cream in your house but you're not going to open it and yeah. apply it so um so it's only when that you get to a place of applying applying the cream so to speak Everything that we're given at birth, if nobody asks the question, or do, you know, that I know of, of asking who are you and why are you here, nobody gets asked that. From birth, we get told 
who we are. So the blank slate begins to get written on, and it's, it's just before birth, actually. Um, but we get told who we are, we don't get asked mm. who we are. I don't know anybody that's had a baby that actually came out of the wound, unless you know them, that came out of the wound and said, hi, this is what my name is. Or anybody that came out and the name was printed on them mm. anywhere. Somebody already preordained that before you were born. This is what this child is going to be called. So you, they're already giving you your identity. Then you'll go to a school and be told, you'll be told that you're not good enough because you know you, you should apply yourself more, you should do mm. these things more. And it's like, you should do all this more for who? Who are, you, who, are you, who are you actually doing it for? So you read the message that to fit into society, this is how I need to be. So your human beingness begins to get removed. So in when it gets removed, you're told all these things of such as for males, boys don't cry, but which is ridiculous because then why have you got tear ducts if you don't mm -hmm. if you don't cry, or you know you shouldn't do that, or this is what you should do, or this is bad and this is good, or for instance at the church, you know if you commit suicide, God will punish you. Mm -hmm. It's like I don't know anyone that's met God because that makes no sense to me. Um, the reason why it makes no sense to me is, um, from what I know, Jesus died to take our sins. So he took our sins as passageway to God. So we don't have direct access to God because we have sins that Jesus needs to take. So I take that as... You know, when we have these um, thoughts and feelings about ourselves, they're basically our sins, is the egoic brain, is the schizophrenic brain, that constantly talks to you about all these negative things about the world and everybody in it. It's like a carrot that's held in front of you that you could never have. So you're constantly chasing and do, doing what it says, and that's what you do with your eating disorder. You constantly chase the carrot that you're on this hamster wheel just chasing this carrot yeah. over and over again because you believe that all these things that you've been told about yourself are actually your identity and nothing to do with you it's all a lie none of it's true you're born a perfect human being but you've lost the human beingness when you were given your name you were told that you're a this like the table's told it's a table and then if you put something onto it you know like not good enough and all these things we believe that it's part of our identity it's got nothing to do with us so everybody tells this tale over and over again and when you look at it you think that's who I am mm. it's like how do you know it's who you are well everybody told me how do they know who you are if they actually were told the same and they don't even know who they are. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm going to say it to you like this. A knife cannot cut itself and a fire cannot burn itself. So a human being, you know, cannot be a human doing and a human being cannot experience themselves unless they're not a human being. So what I mean by that is because a knife cannot cut itself, for instance, we'll tell the story of a knife. So a knife cannot cut itself, so where it decided, it's, it's a little one I've made up, so where it decided was, um, I wonder what it's like to cut yourself. So a wise wizard came and, it said, and said to the knife, the only way that you'd know what it's like to cut yourself is if you turned into something else. So the knife says, how can I do that? So the wizard said, well, you could turn into whatever you want to be that you could cut. And then you'd experience what it's like to be a knife. So the knife decided, OK, I'll turn into a human. Because if I turn into a human, then what will happen is um, I can experience all the pain, what it's like when the blood runs down the arm what it feels like when it's a deep cut, what it feels like to be a small cut. 
so I'll be able to get the whole experience. So the knife agreed with the wizard, I'd like to turn into a human being, how can I do that? So the wizard said, okay, if you keep telling your brain, your subconscious, that you're not a knife, but you're a human being, you will be one. So that's what the knife did. And eventually it forgot that it was a knife and it became a human being. And it went along, completely forgetting it that it was a knife now, now it's a human being and it developed a body and everything and it started to get all these cuts and the pain and, you know, sometimes it was stitched up, sometimes it was just mended, sometimes it was managing to get, you know, go along in life. But the pain become too much for the knife. I don't want to be this anymore. I've had enough of this. A bit like when you went to therapy, I've had enough of this now. Mm. I don't want to keep doing the same thing. It's too painful for me. I don't like being this. Maybe there's something different. Mm. So in a way, that's what, you know, for you, despite all the, the cuts you'd gone through in life to try and not be who you were, to try and mend who you were, you, you still kept going I can't accept on this. Yeah. Just as the knife that had turned into a human being. So the knife then sat and thought, I don't want to be this anymore. So the wizard came back and said, you're not that. You were never that. So all the cuts weren't, weren't really for you. They weren't really real at all, weren't the cuts. They were just experience, it says, that you need to go through to experience what it's like to be a knife. Because to experience what it's like to be something means that you can't be it. Because a knife can't cut itself. So like a human being, to experience being a human being, you have to be a human doing, you have to be something you're not. So everything that everybody ever tells you that you are, it's all made up, you're not that. Mm. You're not all these names, because we made names up. The stories that you tell yourself in your mind, everybody has a story that they tell themselves in the mind, it's all made up. If it was really you, then you'd be okay with it. You wouldn't be able yeah. to remove it. But because you then want it to be removed, there's something in you that says, this, is, this isn't, this can't be me. Yeah? And that's what, that's what the knife that turned into a human being thought. I don't like this, mm. this can't be me. There's got to be something different than me. And it took me a long time to understand that, yeah. that I was like I was as a reaction to things. That's it. Not, so it wasn't me. It wasn't you, you were reacting to your environment. And so the, the knife that turned into a human being was reacting to the cuts, but it didn't still, it was reacting to the cuts of a knife. Mm. But it still, you know, couldn't re. It, it really couldn't believe that it, that was it. Mm. Even even when it had turned into a human being and forgot it was a knife, it still knew that this is unpleasant. This mm. this can't be me. Surely there's so the same as you know the idea that you come up with. So it's then how do I remove it? And what the knife did, it had to apply the cream. What the knife did, then it asked the wizard, how do I remove it? And the wizard said, you have to stop believing it. Mm. You have to stop believing that you're this and start believing that you're a knife, that you're something else. Mm. And then you will become that. Mm. And the knife then returned into being a knife. So for you to return into being what you were born to be, with when you add a blank slate, is to be able to recognise you're not all these things that you were told that you were the labels. Everything that we say is a sound. We just make sense of each other's sounds. Mm. But it doesn't mean that we're it. We can't be it. You know, like this is a table and there's a plan. But because you put that onto the table, does it really mean that now it's a plan? Like, no, it will always be a table. Actually, the table isn't a table. It started off as a tree. So it was shaped. 
and give our own label. Yeah. And that's what happens to us. Yeah. yeah. We're shaped just like a tree. Just like we and yeah. given it a given, and given a, a label. And, and then yeah. things were put onto us then. The things that were put onto us is when you go into institutions that will give you more information about you yeah. that aren't true or about human beings. So what it then says is is, oh, so this is who you are, this is your name, this is your school, and you're just not doing well enough. Mm. Or you just not got you need to get a first as well when you everybody wants to majority of people, mm. sorry, want to go to university and get a first. And it's well, will you reach good enough then? No, because no. voice is never happy. No, because it's then you go back to the wheel of chasing the carrot. Mm. You will never have it. And it's like, will you have it? Will you already have it? Mm. If, so if you, you know, but it's hidden. Well, it's not really hidden, it's in plain sight. It's like we get taught to please the external world. And then we, we're chasing the carrot. Mm. It's never good enough. Because mm. who knows what good enough looks like out there when the majority of people are chasing it. It's so like I was chasing that. I, I, it felt like an outside being, that voice in my head about calories and eating. And so I was chasing to make that happy and, and, and to appease that voice. And I never did, even when I was four stone. It was still saying the same thing. And it's still making me worry about food and weight and it will never satisfied no matter what yeah and what and then when you look at that when you look at the egoic voice or the schizophrenic voice as i say then if you look at that it's actually just a recording of the events and how you have interpreted the world in your life mm. because sometimes you know when you wake up on the morning and what happens, it repeats what's happened yesterday. It'll tell you something about what happened yesterday. So you are the evidence of that. When you have a thought, it's a repeated thought. Mm. It's like, do, we don't actually question, why is it repeat? Why does it keep repeating things back to me? Why are the things that it's repeating a, a negative? Mm. Sometimes you'll get a positive of, wow, that was amazing that that's what happened yesterday. And you'll start enjoying it. And equally, if it wasn't so amazing what happened yesterday, you're going to start feeling sad from that. So now you've just brought that into today. but And that's what you've done. You've kept on with the yesterday and you keep bringing it into today and living your life on an hamster wheel based on the things that happened yesterday because you believe in the recording that's in your brain. Yeah. This is a recording machine, yeah? So it's, what it does is it takes vegetation in, it ferments it, and it gets rid of it. But the recording machine in your head is the one that you end up keeping, so you become psychologically constipated instead of being able to just let it go. Mm. And so when you, what you've learned to do is actually begin to let things go and recognize that you you don't have to work really hard to please the world because that's like looking for your keys outside when you've lost them inside the house yeah when you come into therapy you go inside yeah yeah so when you go inside that's where you are mm. i didn't realize with therapy didn't realize that I'd have to do things and it was down to me. I just thought yeah. somebody would tell me what to do or somebody would make things like the eating make issues it, yeah. stop and like make it better. Everything else on the outside yeah. would be applied in Britain. Yeah. But that's like, you know, the belief, of course you've had that belief because, you know, in the previous, in a previous session, it was like being given um, medication and you're being given medication, so you've rang the fire brigade because there's a fire. And instead of them coming and looking at the root cause and putting the fire out, they actually just came and gave you medication, yeah. which switches the alarm off. And so when you come into here, we have to go and say, okay, let's have a look at the fire. Yeah. And and, and that were really that's... new to me. Yeah. I didn't I didn't understand I that 
there was a cause all these things had caused my eating problems mm. I just thought I just had an eating disorder and it had come out of stress or something like that I didn't understand that who I was was a reaction to my experiences and so that was a it opened up a whole different world for me really mm. um, because I didn't understand or know any of that I just thought I had an eating disorder but let's get it sorted I want it to stop yeah. I didn't understand and it's taken a lot of therapy to understand um, like I've said that there's always a cause it, there's a cause there's a it's a response to something um, and yeah I felt I felt as if I went into therapy with like a couple of problems but therapy found out a lot more problems but that's what I needed because yeah. that's the reality yeah and non actually you know and so it's just recognizing that although that medication has its use it's not that people should come off the medication or anything like that but it's recognizing that you know it's not about invalidating the body it's about listening to the body and what you have to say and so it's only by you understanding these things that you're able to then let them go instead of carrying them as this is part of my identity yeah it's not who you are you do not have a problem you do not have a problem your problem that you're carrying like a suitcase is the things that have been told to you about you that have been done to you that have been given to you that's your problem yeah but it's not yours it's the one that you're carrying yeah so you identify lots of things of mine that's mine and it's it's not yours in the sense of it's who you are yeah. it's yours in the sense of this is what I'm carrying but it was a gift an unwanted gift from someone else yeah and that that really helps and that when you say that my behaviour some because some stuff is my normal that I've lived like this since I was a child I don't notice some of the things that are maybe not right or what other people don't do mm -hmm. because they're my normal and um, exploring that and understanding that not everybody lives their life like how I do yeah. and that it doesn't make me abnormal or odd which I thought I'm behaving normally for the experiences that I've had yeah. that were a real like light bulb moment mm. like ah I do that because of what's happened to me not because I'm just a bit weird yeah so you know as the saying goes in, in therapy you be react normal to an abnormal situation yeah because the situations were abnormal yeah, mm. yeah. so it's taken me a long time to understand things and that's one of the things with therapy it's not a quick fix and it does take people a long time everybody's not the same some people might just need a little bit and some people might need longer mm -hmm. and I think some of the things that have made me feel bad in the in the past is when people again have criticized and said surely you should be better by now you've had all that therapy and it makes you feel bad that you, that you're not that you still struggle and stuff but I'm very different to how I was before it and again that comes up into society's belief of not it's not good enough it has to be a quick fix because yeah. we want a quick fix but I think you know from some experiences and some therapies they have been quite quick mm. so it's that whatever goes on in here or you know whatever we apply such mm. as you know the psychotherapy or when we've done the EMDR therapy for, for you you know we can't capture the light bulb moment if we could capture the mm. light bulb moment of course we'd sell that uh, but no you know we haven't been able to capture mm. that um, so it's it's how you process things or or how that could be speeded along for you know for you and, and one of the things that were speeding along for you were some of the beliefs and reactions that you had to some of the initial traumas um, 
the that bothered you a lot do you want to kind of discuss that like I guess people had used the the term flashbacks yeah and stuff but um I'd have I didn't realize there were memories but um it's like when you say the bot you might not be able to remember things but the body does mm. my body was remembering things even though I wasn't consciously aware of what it was remembering and stuff so there'd be times when I could sort of like feel somebody near me or on me or touch me or I could feel certain fabrics um, against my skin and that kind of thing um, and not even like um, being touched or being felt because it reminded me of, of things and stuff. What are the things that it reminded you of can you say? It reminded me, but I don't know because it were reminding me of what happened when I was little, but I wasn't aware of it. What what happened when I was little? If you get, I don't know. It's really mm. difficult to explain. But I were having. Can you say what happened to you when you were little? Can you say the word, or do you find it difficult? I find it difficult. Um, so, uh, I th I think that goes in waves. Some some days I can say abuse, sexually abused, really quite confidently. Mm. And some days I find it really difficult to acknowledge. Some days I can say it and it means nothing because you can say abuse means nothing. You know, we yeah. can say it's abuse if a child's sent to bed without any tea or if a child's got had their mobile phone removed at school or something. That, that might be given the term so I could I can minimize it, it and and sort of like make it into something and nothing um, by using certain words and stuff like that but sometimes when I say it or when I'm prompted to say it it really hits home to what I'm actually talking about what does it feel like to you today saying it like that um I thought I'd be I thought I'd have been fine but actually it gets stuck Right, so um, there's a different feeling today. So yeah. today, it's, is it uncomfortable? Yeah, okay. it's like I, I I tend to use the acronym CSA because that doesn't sound any that doesn't sound bad, does it? CSA doesn't sound anything. Yeah. So, um, so, so but that's because it's the you don't want to say child sexual abuse. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, What's it like to hear me say it? I can accept it now. Where initially. Before and when I saw my other therapist, I would say you're a two-faced liar, and it's not. It doesn't apply to me. Yeah. Um. I can remember somebody asking me, a friend asking me, um, she came out and said, "Have you been sexually abused?" Um. And I went, "Well, it depends who you ask." So she said, "If I asked Jim, who was my therapist, what would he say?" I'd go, she went, "Oh yeah, he would." She went, what do you say? I'm like, nah, it's a bit far-fetched. Nah, that's not me. Yeah, and Be that was always your saying, it's yeah. far-fetched. Because what Jim did was, I remember it as a, as, it, as I experienced it, so I remember it as a child, and like those feelings, those flashbacks about being touched in certain places or feeling certain fabric, and I was remembering it how it was. Um, and what I thought and felt at the time mm. whereas what Jim did was he put that into adult language and um, when it's put into adult language you can't say it's far-fetched you can't say it. it's something and nothing which I was able to do for a lot of years because I think you've mentioned it before several times I froze at that age I froze as a child so the memory was still repeating as a child mm. And it was only when he actually rephrased what I was saying after I'd stopped talking about food and we talked about other things that he put it into adult words. And even that's quite interesting how you say adult words. What would a child say? I... Or what did your child say? My child says, and still says it now, I refer it to what happened when I was little. Yeah. Um, and that's all I refer it to mm -hmm. and again that's a way of minimizing it and I guess that's a way of getting through because I very rarely connect with it emotionally and when I do it's kind of re really overwhelming. Are you big now? 
I still feel that child. Yeah, it sounds like that. I as well. still feel that yeah. child. I still those things. I still don't like answering the phone. I still won't go in a lift because what if somebody gets in with me mm. and I don't like it and I don't and I don't like going places when I don't know who's going to be there yeah. or what's going to happen. I'm still very very wary of people. Yeah. And that showed on your recent experience when when you um, briefly went to hospital a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, um, I had. Um, a virus it turns out but I had really bad pains in my head and really photosensitive and um, dizziness and things like that and I was in bed um, for a week um, which didn't like me because of my OCD routines but I just physically couldn't get out of the bed because I was sick um, vomiting and and dizziness and stuff I couldn't stand up so I went to A&E and they did some checks and stuff like that but while I was in there I was in there for about nine hours um and after a while somebody came in and i said i needed um the toilet um and she 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 came in um with this like t like a, um a bedpan type of thing them, them cardboard things and just walked towards me and grabbed my legs and said right open your legs um and i was in my pajamas uh, going to attempt to pull my pajamas down and I just started crying. Um, I couldn't say anything else, and I just and I just said, I don't want to go to the toilet now. I don't want to go. And I sort so of you'd gone into your child because you'd you'd not been asked. Yeah, Again, and you it's that not being not being asked if you can be touched, just told yeah. to open your legs. That and is about sensitive. being exposed, I'm not. I don't. I don't like being exposed. I mm. have to wear my underwear all the time, and um, um, or some kind of clothing, and um, it just it just really. I just started crying, and I don't cry very often, but I just started crying, and I sort of said, "I don't want to be exposed. I don't want to be exposed," and I couldn't formulate the word to say why, so I sort of said, "Because of my history, and I've got um, PTSD and anxiety and." That was as much as I could say, and then later on the same nurse came in and said, I'm going to do an ECG, and just came towards me and just got my pyjama top and just pulled it up, mm -hmm. and I didn't have anything underneath. Even though you tried to explain yeah. to the nurse. Yeah, and I said, you know, and I tried to pull it down and say, please, I don't, I can't be exposed, I can't be exposed, um, and, and it was just like, it'll just be a minute, it'll just be a minute, so I just, I just, I just laid there and cried. Um, because I, 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 I sort of I tried to say as much as I could but in that situation I guess I must have been really vulnerable in a side room, room on my own with somebody locked you know in so a so you club. were a stranger despite being a nurse you yeah. were a stranger yeah and not being heard again even though you tried to explain yourself because you've gone into your and because child, I didn't so. feel well I, did, I couldn't yeah. get up and run away I couldn't protect myself like I'm normally on edge yeah. edge all the time Repe prepared to run I'm always in that fight or flight mode mm. and because I was unwell I couldn't I felt as if I couldn't protect myself so I just m my response was crying which is not something that I I do sort of thing but yeah, so my body remembers things that my mind necessarily doesn't, and those kind of feelings could would come back spontaneously. I could be driving in the car and the pressure of my seatbelt or um, the seat on my back, my, lo my lower back, anything touching my lower back, I found really, really sensitive, or uh, um, my lower back being exposed. Um, it'd, it'd give me that shaking feeling that just for a split second it'd, it'd give me that flashback um, but working with you through EMDR those flashbacks have gone Yeah. the memories haven't gone I can still recall them but they don't come spontaneously when I'm in the middle of shopping or when I'm in the middle of just driving or something like that I can recall my memories it's not as if I've lost my memories but they don't they're not in your nervous system. Yeah, they're, they're not so being intrusive and, yeah. and just popping up all the time, mm. that kind of thing. And that, I can honestly say that what that were EMDR. 
that yeah, did that. Yeah, so that was pretty fast because that was yeah. after one one session, yeah. and then the other one was the body experience that you had in your in your throat. Can yeah. You, can you say what that was like? Ever since I've um, been little, every now and again, just spontaneously, not linked not linked with anything that I'm aware of, I just used to get this like lump in my throat as if I couldn't swallow. I felt as if I was choking. I can remember in my teens going to the doctors once saying there's something in my throat I can't I can't swallow I can't swallow it's like there's nothing there it's clear but it felt as if I got a lump in my throat and that sometimes I'd really struggle to like swallow and that kind of thing and working with you on that that has gone down to a minimal yeah yeah and then the memory that came up can you say what the memory was I think you don't have to say it yeah no I think it was it wasn't understanding that that lump in my throat was um linked with what happened when I was little so that was another memory that my body was remembering um which I wasn't aware of I mm. didn't know I just thought I've got something stuck in my throat or I can't swallow I can't so I didn't realise the, the abuse. Yeah, it was it was my body remembering yeah. um an act that had happened and stuff, but I didn't I didn't know about that. Mm. Um mm. it wasn't through talking and understanding about it. And like I say, putting putting what I can remember and my experiences into an adult words and an, ad, and an adult phrase and then oh, you just can't... the phrase that they are rather than them being this is for a child and this is for an adult yes yeah. just recognizing that is what it is yeah. Yeah. I, I try and labels and names and stuff like that i think can have a can have a big impact um like saying stuff like csa it just minimizes it it doesn't sort of like um say the seriousness you know when I see stuff on the news and stuff like that and I think you're making it sound really not as bad as what it is exactly because that's another program that we're given is to minimize what's happened um that society minimizes lots of things to make itself feel better really and um so it's that it's what it does to a human being and you know for instance the physical damage that's been done to you that you have to live with um, so the operations that you've had to have um, do you want to talk about that yourself? um yeah um i had long term i've had issues with my bladder so not being able to control it um frequency and urgency and because it's that department and that area, I've never said anything to anybody at all about it. Mm. Um, and it wasn't till a couple of years ago that um, my body started becoming unwell. Um, I sort of like carried on and carried on, but um, I started developing chronic fatigue syn syndrome symptoms. Um, I had shingles three times in a year. My body was saying it wasn't really happy. And when I was um, talking to my GP about things, and um, one of the things I said was, oh, and I have trouble with my bladder. So she's like, ah, that's one thing I can help you with, and referred me to neurology, or urology, whatever it is, and um, for an overactive um, bladder for frequency and stuff. Um, I was really uncomfortable about that. I remember saying to Jim, therapist at the time, I'm not going and nobody's going to touch me. Nobody's going to touch me. But it was like, go with an open mind, see how far you can go with it. And that kind of thing, don't, don't put your limits on until you, you get there. Mm. Um, I couldn't let anybody touch me or look at me or anything like that. But the service were really, really understanding. I wrote down on a piece of paper why, because I couldn't say it. My voice was like gone again and I just gave it to him and went, that's why I don't want to be touched or looked at. And I said, if you don't want to help me, that's absolutely fine. I don't want to waste your time. Um, but they said, oh no, we'll, we'll treat you. Um, 
so I have medication and and um, acupuncture to try and help. It's a non-invasive um, stuff um, that didn't work. And one of the things that they suggested was um, an implant. How I describe it, it's like a bit of a pacemaker for your bladder. Um, and um, this, it was when I was talking to the surgeon, he said, it's very, very common is this problem with your bladder in people who have experienced what you've experienced. Yeah. And that was like, what? Hmm. I didn't know it was anything to do with that. Yeah. And then so how he these... described it was, the damage to the nerves and to the bladder yeah. had been from um, what, what had happened when I was little. And it's those things I think that, you know, quite often get departmentalised, don't they, instead of all joining together and saying, this is the impact of abuse that, that, that has on the human yeah. being. It's, it's, it's physical, it's mental, it's psychological, it's spiritual, it's everything. Yeah. Um, There's not an area of my life no. that it hasn't affected, tinged, shaped, or completely ruined. Exactly, such as not, not having relationships, not having a family of your own. Yeah. Not I can't even have a bath there. without a jumper on. Yeah. And I can't, I have to have a bath with my jumper on. And I have to have the bath water so scalding hot that it burns me and I feel as if I'm going to pass out. Yeah. Um, but for me, that was just normal. That's it. And the other things like the way that you sleep. And, yeah. And, you know, how you have to, you know, wrap yourself and, and yeah. lay in a I certain sleep way. In a, I sleep in a certain way and I have to have that, like I can't let my pyjama top have a gap at the bottom of my back. I really have to have my, my lower back sort of like, padded and filled in and stuff mm. I hate being exposed yeah. Um, just yeah there isn't an area that it hasn't affected it hasn't and, but it wasn't until the surgeon said and made the comment that the nerves have been damaged to your bladder when you were little and that's you know that's a common thing and I did go to a, a group um, for people who have experienced um, childhood sexual abuse and there were only about five of us, and every one of us had bladder issues. Um, so it is a common um, side effect, implication, or whatever I don't, whatever you want to call it. It's it's common, which I didn't know. I'm finding a lot out. Most things we talk about is like, oh, it's linked with that. Oh, it's linked with that. There's always it always comes back to what happened when I was little, and and it's that recognition of, you know, for you and, and for those around you that don't really recognise even even some of the nursing staff in hospital where the things are put together, um, we just do this, you know, we'll do this bit and we'll do this bit instead of you being a whole person. Yeah. I guess you can see now why we have to join all the dots. Yeah, and you can't just to. pick and choose what you want to talk about yeah. and you don't know what's going to happen. At the beginning of therapy, I couldn't have even envisaged any of the stuff that has come out or how I am or anything. Mm. It's you can't you can't predict you can't um, plan what it's going to be like. You've just got to be very willing to yeah. explore anything. Um, and luckily, I've had therapists who have put up with when I've been very close mind and got me through that yeah. and been patient and that takes time mm. um, to build that trust um, and I'm still not even there with it mm. so when people are referred for a few sessions of therapy and stuff I, I just think it could end up causing more damage than, than not having any at all being left with some stuff with all the stuff open and then yeah you know, which is which is what I was stuff. before I came my gap between NHS therapy and private therapy um, the NHS therapy didn't stop because I was ready to have it stopped so when it was stopped due to funding and had me having enough sessions and that kind of thing I did go really downhill in the six months before I started seeing you mm. um, and I made that decision that I will pay and I'll see somebody because I don't want to go and undo the work that I'd done in therapy and I knew that I couldn't do it on my own. Yeah. So I made that decision to 
carry on working on stuff. And recognising as well, as the, it's understandable why people would say, well, why aren't you kind of done yet? Why aren't you cooked yet? Because yeah. you should be done by now. But that's the message given to society is that to undo something that could potentially have been, you know, practically the whole of your life long, yeah. to be able to do it in a few you know, in a few weeks when you've got to untangle all the yeah. all the areas and like you say, build trust with the person because you've been let down a lot. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So but are, are there any other points you'd like to discuss today? Just that I know I need to stop using acronyms and I know I start need to saying it how it is. I think I think Would like you need to do that for for me, okay. I do. Because I think, and for other people, I think we need to start having conversations which are not very nice and which are truthful and reality. I think sometimes we're too preoccupied trying to make things nice and palatable. Where some are they nice really though? The reality no. is, is that... Things aren't very nice, that's what the reality yeah, but is. We the try voice in your head isn't very but nice. But we try and make it nice, don't we, well, by saying just, acronyms. I think we need to start saying yeah. proper words. But that's the made-up world, isn't it? That's mm. the fantasy world that we fantasise. But the reality is, is that we all act and react to each other. And if we have a voice, you've got less likely chance of reacting in a certain way if that voice is telling you something negative if you have a negative belief about yourself or other people you know then it's not the, the world cannot you know is not a very nice place but in some areas if we change it it can be a beautiful place we decide which where do we want to live do we want to live in heaven or do we want to live in hell because it's all it's all right here waiting for us to that's our free will that's our choice mm -hmm. to take um, Sometimes we don't get given that choice because, you know, your freedom gets taken away and so do you. You get taken away by everybody telling you who you are and it starts with yeah. your name. You know, what you are, what school you're going to go to, what clothes you're going to wear, what friends you're going to have. We don't have freedom. We get that, do we? Yeah, I just yeah. think it will help me if I start seeing it for what it is rather than what I remember. Yeah, and that's and it's about the letting go. Yeah, it's a lot about just just it's done now. It's over with. It's in the past, and it's like you was given poison, and some people keep drinking the poison, expecting the other person, the perpetrator, to die. They're not going to. The only person that's going to is you, from poisoning yourself with it. And that's what makes us ill. Is that. You know, we get given this bottle of poison sometimes when we're young. Not everybody gets given it, but when you're given it, you carry on drinking it. Yeah. Long after the perpetrator has lost interest in in you and moved on to someone else. Is it okay to end that? Yeah. <laughs>